Good morning and welcome to another of the IVF Daddies podcasts. Today, I feel I'm going full circle. We have the amazing Professor Cheryl Homer on today. And Cheryl is actually one of the first people that I met when I started doing this. So welcome, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for asking me here today. It's it's fantastic to have you. We met back probably well, about nine years ago, and you you had started Andrology Solutions, which is a company that you still run in 2007. And really, you've been one of my go-to people whenever I have any questions around sperm or challenges or anything, because you are, in my mind, the guru on all of that. In series one, we did an episode on my sperm freezing experience, which was embarrassing to say the least. But I think this is one of the things I want to talk to you about because it's men just get really embarrassed when we're talking about sperm and issues and infertility and just in general, like it's that taboo, the stigma, the macho, all of that. Is is that something you find in your day-to-day world? I do. And probably a good example of that is if I'm out with friends having dinner and if women were to discuss their fertility problems, everybody would be very empathetic. But if a man mentioned it, everybody would start giggling. So I think this is the difference. And it really is, it is a condition. It's just like female infertility, it is a condition. And so it's not something to be laughed at, it's something to be taken seriously. And of course, when we think about children, we think about families, these are very important things. So there's nothing silly or funny about a sperm, which actually contributes to half of that child. So I think we really need to change the way that we view this. I think it's really very important. So I have a question for you. Now I've been doing this for a while and I should really have maybe Googled it, but what does andrology actually mean? So that's that's also a, a strange one as well, because we all know what gynecology is. We all know that that is the, the looking at the reproductive health of the woman. But andrology is the antithesis of that. It's the male side. So it is really looking at the reproductive health and pathology, if you like, of the male reproductive system. So it is the, the opposite, if you like, of gynecology. It's the male Amazing. side. So that, I guess, really leads us neatly into sperm, which is one of the reasons why we're talking today because you are the guru on all things sperm in my mind. Could you explain a little bit about where sperm is made, where it is stored, how long the process takes, everything almost from a basic biology lesson to any man or woman that's listening today that actually is embarrassed to ask these questions? Okay. The sperm are actually made in your testicles. That's where they're made. There are There's about a kilometer of tubules inside your testes oh dear god and you make about a thousand sperm a second if you're normally fertile in those little tubules in the testes but that's the factory that's where they're made so they don't get stored there and it's like anything when you're looking at a an item that's being made in a factory it it's taken out of the factory as soon as it's made and it's put in a warehouse So your warehouse basically is what we call the epididymis. It's a little sack that sits on the top of the testicle inside the scrotum. And as soon as the sperm are made, they move into this epididymis, which is where they are stored, and they wait until ejaculation, um, at which point they start moving up through the little tube that connects the epididymis to the urethra, which is the tube that um, is inside the penis that carries the sperm out at ejaculation. Sperm will build up in the epididymis until you're ready to ejaculate. So the longer you wait to ejaculate, the more sperm will build up in the epididymis. And some of them will start accumulating at the bottom of the tube that takes them out, the vas deferens. They'll start to accumulate there as well, but they'll happily sit there waiting until they're ready to come out. Until they're ready to come out. And is there an optimal time for them to come out? I.e., is there a, if somebody's trying to get pregnant, is there, okay, we need to do this every day, every two days, three days, four days? What's it from a sperm production and ejaculation perspective? Okay, first of all, the sperm 
take about 72 days or so to develop in the testes from the time that they start off as a little immature sperm, to, which is a round cell, to become the little tadpoles that we see. Those little tadpoles will sit in the epididymis for about 10 to 14 days to complete their, their maturation. Then they're ready to come out. Now, just think about the warehouse, the epididymis that's accumulating sperm that are being made all the time. And sperm need to function. They need to breathe. They need to. And if they're all packed in to an epididymis, after a while, it gets a bit cozy in there and the environment starts to get a little bit worn. And then fresh sperm coming in are not going to be very happy coming into an environment where they don't have a lot of access to nutrients and oxygen and all the rest. So in order to keep the sperm fresh, we recommend that you empty that epididymis at least every three or four days. Oh, wow. You can okay. empty it less, that's fine, but don't more, more. keep it longer than about five, five days because the sperm will start to build up and start to feel a little bit unhappy. Yeah. And so, I guess one, one of the questions that I ask is, why is it that some days there's, there seems to be more and then some days there seems to be less? Is that a function of time or is that just the factory is not producing as quickly as it should? So you are talking about the volume, the fluid. You're not really, you can't see the sperm in there. You're talking about the amount that you're yeah. producing. And on average, you will build up about half a mil of volume every day. So the longer the abstinence, the, the larger the volume. So if you ejaculate every day, you're going to have a smaller volume than if you wait a couple of days. So that could be one thing. And that's just the liquid. But I guess also if you're yeah. ejaculating every day, the quantity is going to be lower of sperm because you haven't stored up. Exactly. So the quantity will be less, but the quality will be better. Ooh. So it's so not about quantity. It's, it's about, about the, all about the quality. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this is really very important. I see a lot of people who delay intercourse until the ovulation time because they think that if they wait and they build it all up, they'll have more there. But what they'll end up doing is having a lot of dead and dying sperm. And, you know, by the time they've made love a couple of times over the ovulation period, the egg is ovulated, it's gone by the time the sperm are of better quality because he's ejaculated two or three times to oh, fresh. Wow. So basically what I advise people is to make love regularly throughout the cycle. I would say that obviously a woman is not going to be fertile the last week before she starts her period. She's not going to be very likely to be, in for, to be fertile when she starts her period and for that week. But all that time in between, you should actually be trying to ejaculate, have intercourse, should I say, every two to three days yeah. and then outside of that window when your partner's not likely to be fertile and you don't want to have intercourse necessarily you must ejaculate every three to four days to keep it fresh so to so, keep it fresh you want the new swimmers swimming yeah. properly you every two to three days okay that's good if you have intercourse every day or a couple of times a day it's not going to improve things more than if you wait every other day it's not going to make a difference mm. not going to harm you by any means the more sex you have the better but and, uh, and professor cheryl homer has now been quoted to say the more sex you have the better right. <laughs> a lot of people struggle because with their busy lives yeah. they just they try to time it over the ovulation period and i think that's a serious problem for people Oh, that's, I never even thought about that. So then you, I think we're touching upon something that, that I'm very interested in, which is what makes good versus bad sperm? We know that if you're storing it up too much in the warehouse, it's getting crowded, it's, getting, it's not a great environment. What else can men do to improve their sperm quality? And, and how do you, yeah, what can they do? So I, I think it's very important to understand that there are, many factors that can affect your sperm 
And the most important thing is that if there is a problem with your sperm, you need to be investigated to make sure there's not an underlying pathology, that it's not a condition there that is causing your poor sperm parameters, because most of the time there is an underlying condition. So how can somebody go about testing for that? So this is the problem, because there aren't many people who are out there who can test. So we know there's thousands of gynecologists out there, but it's very difficult to find an andrologist who is a urologist who has a special interest in male infertility, which is an andrologist, a uroandrologist. I'm very fortunate because I live in London and there are a lot of them based here. There are others based around the country, but you have to look and see. And unfortunately, a lot of the urologists who specialize in andrology are doing penile enlargements. They're not doing male infertility. Oh my God, so they're doing plastic surgery over actually yep. looking at infertility. Mm -hmm. huh. So you need to be careful. But these are the people who are going to examine you for an underlying condition. And they will. it will invariably involve, just like the women, hormone testing, it will involve testicular ultrasound scans. It will involve a physical exam. It may involve some genetic screening as well. And it may involve some infection screening. So there's all these kinds of things. I, I'm just touching on a few. Yeah. But there I, could be I, any number of conditions. Any number of things. So I think somebody would... General health, general health diabetes is one. Yeah. A lot of underlying conditions can cause poor infertility. Don't forget your sperm are a marker of your general health. So if your sperm is poor, it could be there's an underlying health condition, and that's why you must go to your doctor and get yourself checked out at the very least to make sure that there isn't an underlying condition. So how is someone going to know if their sperm is poor? They just come and do a sperm test first? A sperm test, yeah. Yeah, and does that have to be done with an andrologist? Because I, I know I've seen something... I think in Boots, the chemist, where you can go and do a sperm test. Does that work? Because there's this, again, there's this embarrassment factor of I need to go to a clinic, I need to go into a room, ejaculate into a, in, in a cup. And it's just like men, it's, we feel weird doing that. If, if Of course. And of course you want to try and do something at home. I don't think there's any harm in doing something at home. But what you have to understand is, that the reliability of those tests is virtually zero. Oh. There was a paper published recently by our professional organization that significantly warned against these things because none of them are actually reliably tested in terms of the accuracy of the results. And to be fair to them, they do say on the instructions that these this is just a guideline. It's not an accurate result. Crikey. I think... It's a much better idea for you to go to your GP and be referred to a proper andrology laboratory to have your test done. Mm. There are standards that these laboratories should meet. They are international standards. And in the UK, the labs are accredited against what we call UCAS. And you can check to see if the labs are accredited. Those are the, the best, the Rolls-Royce standard tests that you will get. Plenty of NHS laboratories are UCAS accredited. Very few of the fertility clinics actually have UCAS accreditation. So you're much better off going to your GP and getting it done through the NHS. Wow. And that is interesting because one of the things that we're doing a lot about is trying to empower women to go and be tested for their fertility so they know, for example, whether or not They've got enough eggs. Should they look at egg freezing or not? And this is one of the other things then really what we should be doing is empowering men to say, do you know what? Maybe I'm trying for a baby. Maybe I have been and it's not working. Or I just want to know, where do I stand? Is that something that can be done? You can go to your doctor and say, hey, just I want to see where my sperm is. To be fair to the NHS will only offer tests if you have a symptom of a problem. A symptom of a problem of infertility is if you have been trying to conceive for 12 months without a conception. If you have been trying for 12 months, you haven't conceived, then you have every right to have to go to your GP and ask for a test. Either there's private laboratories that will test as well. But yeah, there's a cost involved, right? Exactly. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So that's really interesting. And then I guess, so you, we've touched upon it, infertility, the definition of infertility is you've been trying for a year with no success. So in that instance, I guess the quickest, easiest, almost the variable to remove the quickest and easiest is the man to go and get tested, right? It's not always the women. Yes. And I think that that's the thing is I think men don't like going to the doctors in general. And a lot of things that I've found when I speak to the patients is they suddenly tell me all sorts of things that could be affecting their fertility. And I say, why have you never gone to your doctor? And they say, oh, because I'm getting older and I just expect it. And, what, and actually, they just don't want to go to the doctor. So I think it's a general malaise amongst the men. I can assure you, as a woman, the most unpleasant thing is to go and have an investigation by a gynecologist. Yeah. It is the bits. And, and I think this is just something that I'm sorry, guys, you just have to put up with because you have to produce a sample near to the laboratory as possible. They are clinical environments, I'm afraid. And I think uh, without being too mean, you just have to get your heads around it because there's no way of doing it properly in any other sort of environment. But other than that, I think I hope that when you go and do these things that the people who meet and greet you and show you the rooms are pleasant enough. And I think you deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always remember my, my experience was a very pleasant, but it was just, I felt embarrassed. I was yeah. this, I walked in and it was almost like all eyes were on me. We're all know, we know what you're doing in that room. Yeah. I was just like, Oh, I just, and then I, as you say, every woman I know who goes to their gynecologist, it's not pleasant every single time. And, realistically what am I doing ejaculating I'm like okay. I, okay so but that's 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 great again so I think I'm just trying to in my head so you've been trying for a year you're not having a baby we then go and test again it's not quantity it's quality that we're looking for so what are things that if I've had an STI in the past like I've had gonorrhea chlamydia or something like that can that affect my sperm it can, because if the bacteria gets into your tubules where the sperm are made, it can block those tubules up, just like chlamydia blocks fallopian tubes in women. You get oh. tubular fertility due to chlamydia in women, and you get your tubules blocked. In men, it can block your tubules. It can cause scarring, so it can cause permanent damage. So that can significantly reduce your sperm count. We know that other organisms, viruses, for example, like mumps. So a lot of people may not be vaccinated against mumps. And the, the, the risk with that is that if you get mumps once you reach puberty and if it gets into your testicles and you get orchitis, which is inflammation in the testes, that can totally wipe out your sperm forever. So you right. have to really careful if you think you've got an inflammation in your testes go and get your sperm stored immediately because when the inflammation subsides you may find you have no sperm so i think that's really very important oh great i'm panicking i don't I, well, I'm, I'm sitting here i'm now panicking going oh my god what if i do i've got my kids i don't need my sperm anymore but wow okay <laughs> <laughs> if only if your testes get inflamed, if you feel they're getting inflamed, go and freeze your sperm. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so that's if you've got viruses or antibacterial uh, infections that things have. What is, because I was talking to somebody and they had a varicocele. What is that? Yeah. So varicocele is actually the leading known cause of infertility and also especially of secondary infertility where people have a child and then they find it difficult to find a second one and what it is it's um development of a, of a varicose clump of varicose veins in the testes basically normally a, a doctor might see it and say oh it's nothing to worry about it's varicose veins we don't worry about varicose veins wherever they are the problem is that if they are in the testes they can alter the blood flow Testes are outside of your body for good reason. They need to be at about three to four degrees cooler than the rest of your body. But if you have a varicose vein in there, the blood from the body starts to accumulate and sit in the testes without flowing around. You heat up the testes to body temperature, which is 37. It's another four degrees. And that basically cooks the sperm. 
Oh. Men who have undescended testes struggle with producing sperm. And, but if you heat them up outside the testes, you damage the sperm. But varicocils can be repaired. And the studies... Just like, just like varicose veins can be repaired, right? Yes. There are different ways of repair, but the studies do show that there is a significant improvement in sperm count, shape and motility, significant reduction in DNA damage in the sperm, and a reduction in the oxidative stress levels, which are all associated with male infertility, and an increase in natural pregnancy and IVF pregnancy rate as well. So wow. a lot of patients who come to us, multiple failed IVF attempts, we find they have a varicocele, they have the varicocele repaired, they can, they have a much better chance of it working again. So well, not I, always works, but... No, yeah, there's no guarantee, unfortunately, with all of this, is there? But I, and so that leads me on to, so if temperate, so if the blood flow is ra raising the temperature in the testicles and the testes, what if I wear like briefs and is sit in a sauna and or have hot baths and, and things like that. Does that also affect sperm? So if you can imagine a monkey out in the jungle doing that, he'd probably have a problem with his fertility. But we're not far I can't, from... I'm sorry, I can't imagine a monkey wearing briefs sitting in a sauna <laughs> in the jungle. <laughs> no, the thing is, they, we do know that obviously we are human beings and we're not meant to be wearing clothes. And the problem is with clothes is that they heat us up which is great if we've got cold weather, but not if you're a testicle. It's not great if you're a testicle. So you must try and keep your testes as cool as possible. I don't mean by any sort, don't ever ice your testes. Don't put frozen peas on there. Don't buy these ice packs or anything like that because you're cold shocking the sperm. They don't want to be cold. They want to be at 33 degrees. That's warm. It's not... But I, I've now got a picture of my head, somebody walking around with a bag of frozen peas. In their pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. I'm constantly doing that because. Serious face, Richard. Serious face. I'm like, I've got a monkey in a jungle wearing pants in a sauna. And I've now got somebody walking around with a bag of peas in their pants. Okay. <laughs> so we need to keep the testes at 33 degrees. It for yeah. ideal creation. Okay. Ideally, or they can be cooler, room temperature, whatever you want to call them to do, swimming in a cold swimming pool is fine. But we really don't want to be icing them or really chilling them to very chilly temperatures. Yeah. The problem is overheating and it's just a few degrees. That's why the heating business is a problem. Why sitting in saunas, why wearing tight underwear, all of these things even if you're driving long distances, all of these things, sitting on a bicycle, pedal bike, where you could be causing friction between your testes and the saddle, that could potentially cause problems. So all of these heat-inducing things can potentially elevate testicular temperature. They don't always. It depends on everybody's physiology. Mm. Not everybody that's that's really interesting because I did once talk to a professional cyclist that was his job he was a, a professional mm. cyclist and his sperm was terrible and he was like why is this so bad and now that makes yeah. sense yeah because i and was like you're a sportsman you like you yeah. your nutrition is amazing da, 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 da. but actually that's uh, interesting yeah that could be one of the reasons but there may be other reasons maybe <laughs> others too but we'll go with that and then so a friend of mine a few years ago had uh testicular cancer and had a testicle removed does that have a significant impact on sperm production, quantity, quality, et cetera? If he started off with pretty good sperm quality to begin with, removing one testicle won't, shouldn't really significantly affect his sperm production. In fact, the other testicle may well try and make up for it. So if he started off with normal parameters, he may well have normal parameters now, maybe slightly low account, but he may still have, we see patients who come back afterwards to retest where their sperm quality is well within the normal range and it shouldn't really affect it. However, what does affect it is if you have to have chemotherapy afterwards. So that can potentially be problematic. And not only just for the sperm count, motility and everything, but for the genetic integrity of the sperm, more importantly, 
Now, a lot of the treatment for testicular cancer for chemotherapy can be reversible. And a lot of times people come back six months later, they've got sperm back in, coming back in the ejectment again. What we do tell people is the evidence out there shows you need to wait a minimum of 18 months to two years before you try to conceive naturally with your sperm. Oh, wow. Because it can take up to that length of time for the genetic integrity to recover. Even right. though, so even though the sperm takes 72 days to, to synthesize, so to, to from start to finish, you've got to wait nearly 18 months for the genetic part of inside the sperm to be fixed. Exactly. So sperm take just under three months to develop completely in the testes and the epididymis. So it's just about just under three months that they take to develop. So after that's one sperm cycle. So you can check after one sperm cycle to see if the sperm's come back, or if not, maybe two sperm cycles. But even if the sperm have come back, wait for for the testes. I would always recommend people always to freeze their sperm if they're going to have a testicle removed because you've only got one left. So it's like your spare sperm in the bank. And also in case you might need to have chemo in the future, it's always a good idea. If, it's buying if, optionality, just like egg freezing for, for women, sperm mm -hmm. freezing for men, you're buying the optionality in case something happens. So that then leads me on to another question of, okay, we've the, the chemotherapy stuff, obviously the radiation, all those different things affecting sperm. What other medications can affect sperm? Because I always remember when I was about to give mine, the doctor said, are you on Propecia or Finasteride for you? keeping my hair, which you know, I'm not, I've got quite a nice hair. Thank you very much for saying. <laughs> but, I mean, what other medications out there do have an impact on sperm and, and what medicate, like both negative and positive? So I think that's a really interesting question. And I look at this from a scientific perspective. Um, there are Thousands and thousands of drugs out there. So I can't tell you which ones affect fertility and which don't. We know that things like SSRI inhibitors, antidepressants, um, a lot of recreational drugs, um, and some antibiotics can have an effect on your fertility. And also we mentioned chemotherapeutic drugs as well. Steroids have a huge impact on your fertility. They can oh, wow. wipe out your sperm altogether. We'll talk about that. Altogether. So if you're um, a big but, gym goer taking steroids, oh, you can have oh, zero. Oh, yes, zero. Wow. And I'll explain that in a minute. But the important thing about medications is a lot of medications are not tested on male infertility or male fertility. A lot of the studies have been done on rats and mice which are not the same as human beings. And a lot of the studies are done on pregnancy rates. They don't all look at sperm quality and they don't all look at DNA integrity of sperm, for example. If you're looking at a drug that we know has an effect on male infertility, that's one thing. But if you're taking a drug and it hasn't been tested properly, as a scientist, I would say, as long as it's okay with your doctor, Try not to take any medication if it's not necessary. Do not be buying things over the counter at Boots just because you've got, I don't know, whatever, skin condition or something, because we don't know what effect that might have on sperm. Interesting. Some so clinicians will respond and say, there's no evidence to show it has an effect, so it's fine, take it. Yeah. As a scientist, I would say if the studies haven't been done, there's a possibility. It's almost like we don't know the secondary impact. It's like you're taking it for A, but it could affect it. We just don't know because they haven't tested for it. Exactly. Huh. And I've seen, which I think is a good thing, a rise in people taking PrEP, obviously the HIV drug to, to stop contracting HIV, or in theory, 99% effectiveness. Have there been any studies on PrEP and sperm as yet? I don't know. It's not my field. I can look it up for you, but <laughs> at the moment, I really don't well, know. I, I love that about. because that's a segue into getting yeah. you back because I think I'm fascinated. I could keep talking yeah. to you for days about yeah. this because for me, yeah. I'm not a biologist, but I, I obviously I work in this field now and I love it. And I just, 
every time I talk to you, I learn something new and you oh. are a phenomenal educator and, a, and a, an amazing human being. And I've known you now for many years and I love our chat. So I just want to say thank you. This has been super informative and I'm going to be asking you to come back so we can have another episode because I feel like we've only I've taken up lots of time. We haven't touched upon everything we need to. But Cheryl, thank you so much. You are a superstar and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about IVF and surrogacy, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please share and follow our social media handle at IVF Daddies. We are here to answer any questions and to guide you through this very personal process.